Hello. So today I want to talk about how does one begin to study Islamic history? How does the average layperson start to get an uh, introduction or grasp of Islamic history? And I'm going to give you some good book recommendations of what to read. And, you know, the, I'm just going to focus on literature that's in the English language for an average reader. And slowly I'll progress to kind of bigger and more advanced books. And hopefully with this uh, book set here that I'm going to propose, this kind of curriculum if you want to call it, one could get a basic foundation in Islamic history, both political history and intellectual history. And from there, one could ideally move on to study Islamic history books that are much more specialized. And I'll talk about first a very little basic book here called The Formation of Islam. Religion and Society in the Near East, 600 to 1800, by Jonathan Berkey. And so, in my undergraduate degree, I took a class on Middle East history, and this was one of the textbooks that was assigned. And I read the book vigorously, cover to cover. You can see some of my tabs there, and enjoyed it quite thoroughly. You can see some of my highlighting and different things in the book there, you know. Um, and so I really do hope that you pause the video and you can, you know, go on Amazon or wherever and try to find these books here. Um, I'll try to put links below in the description as well. And also, this is a, a book here that I kind of find interesting and read. From time to time, I've actually read uh, it cover to cover um, when I was in undergraduate school. It's called The History of Islam. It's by Akbar Shah Najib Babadi, revised by Safi Rahman Mubarak Puri. And it is a three volume work on Islamic history written from the theological perspective of a believing, practicing Muslim. And um, it has its value, but I feel like uh, it's not as comprehensive as many other books. And unfortunately, the author doesn't really cite his sources at all in any academic way, shape, or form, so you don't know where he's getting his information, which to me is uh, uh, quite problematic, especially for people who want to do further research and to know more about a certain topic. Um, and he writes his history as if uh, Orientalist literature doesn't exist. He doesn't respond to it. He doesn't talk about it. He simply ignores it. Um, and for a lot of Muslims nowadays who want to know about history, they want to grapple with Orientalist ideas. They Maybe they want to refute Orientalist ideas, or maybe they want to know what is the Orientalist perspective. Even if they disagree with it, they want to understand it. And so... I think that's a major disappointment to the book, but it is three volumes too, which can also make it a, a big read for some people and also a big purchase for some people. It is published by Dar es Salaam Publishers. You can find it at a lot of different bookstores, at least I can here locally in Minnesota. I bought that at a you know 24th Mall in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yeah, I've seen it at the Carmel Mall too, so there's lots of places you can get this book. Another good um, sort of introductory book that's definitely a lot cheaper and slightly smaller is this one here, A History of Islamic Societies, third edition by Ira Lapidus, and he is a professor at Berkeley University, and it's by Cambridge University Press, and he looks at Islamic history from a sociological point of view, focusing on societies and the history on the ground of, you know, what's the sociological data of the Muslim world. I also find it to be much more comprehensive um, than the previous book I just mentioned. He, for instance, in this book, he details history of rural dynasties in, Afri in Africa, also how Islam came to places like Kazakhstan and Indonesia. So it's, it's a very, you know, great read. And I feel like he uh, isn't biased and he's not 
overly orientalist if, if you might want to call it that way or revisionist as some call it I feel like it's it's a, a great and, and wonderful book and I'm just trying to give you the books that kind of just purely focus on history both uh, intellectual and political just kind of some introductory books here and the next one that I would recommend is also a three volume work and this one I read in graduate school here the Venture of Islam, Conscience and History in a World Civilization. And so this is three volumes. It's written by Marshall Hodgson. It's kind of canonical in uh, the academic study of Islam in Western universities. Um, Hodgson wrote this book, I think, when he was 40. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's quite the work. It's from University of Chicago Press, my alma mater. Um, and I mean, this is highly beneficial. It covers a lot of different topics, almost all, it covers all the regions of the Muslim world, kind of like Ir Lapidus. It's very comprehensive. I'll try to bring it closer there so that you can see a more detailed view of it. It's easily accessible for purchase on Amazon. Like I said, I'll try to put links below for these books. Highly recommended. And then somebody who maybe is um, more interested in um, perhaps just political history, like if you're really interested in the Umayyads or um, the Abbasids or like the Arab conquest when they came out of Arabia, I would look at Professor Hugh Kennedy. So here's a, a book from him. And The Great Arab Conquest, How the Spread of Islam Changed the World We Live In by Hugh Kennedy. So Hugh Kennedy is currently professor of Arabic at the School of Arabic Studies in London, SOAS. He has taught in the Department of Medieval History at the University of St. Andrews and was elected Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 2000. The author of When Baghdad Ruled the Muslim World, Professor Kennedy, lives in the United Kingdom. And so he also is not, uh, I would say, overly biased or very revisionist or orientalist, as some may call it. I really, really like his scholarship, and I really like his work. He brings archaeological evidence, you know, that many Muslim historians are just simply unaware of. I definitely like his work. Um, and the unfortunate reality is that many of um, the Muslim world's writings, their manuscripts, uh, these primary sources that historians would use, have been plundered by the West. They lie in Western universities and access to them is only by a privileged few, um, predominantly Western academics. And because of this, they usually have access to a lot more historical artifacts or documents or manuscripts that non-Westerners do not have. And so reading Oriental Orientalist literature, rather, is uh, very unfortunately necessary in one sense to um, know about Islamic history, no matter how colonizing their historiography may be. And so it's something you just simply have to engage with. And in order to do that, I think a very good introductory book to that topic is Orientalism by our beloved Edward Said. And he wrote this book, and he's a professor at Columbia University, Al Marhum Edward Said. He passed away. Um, this book changed the field of Islamic studies in the West and Islamic history forever. And this is the original first edition, published in 1978. And I highly recommend it. I've read this book quite a lot, cited it in academic papers. But anybody who is interested in Islamic history needs to know this book. And it helps you to understand the history of Orientalism, how to deal with it, how to engage with it. Um, people who are interested maybe in modern Islamic history, I would recommend them this book as well. So, A History of the Modern Middle East, William Cleveland and Martin Bunton. This was also a textbook used in my undergraduate class on Islamic history. 
It's a very good introductory reading for modern political history in the Islamic world. Also, The Impossible State is pretty good by Wa al Halaq. Frankly, anything by Wa al Halaq is quite good when it comes to Islamic law. This book in particular is interesting because it also deals with modernity, deals with uh, political history as well as intellectual history. And he basically argues that the concept of the modern Western nation state is incompatible with Sharia. You can't have Sharia in that state. It just won't simply won't function and it'll all fall apart. So the idea that Islamists can somehow marry the secular state with a Sharia state is just uh, intellectually incoherent. Um, you also have, you know, people like Jonathan Brown who are doing, you know, history on more specific topics here. You got like slavery and Islam. Um, but as I've kind of mentioned, I think the important thing is when you're reading about history, you have to be able to engage with modern Western thought. Because historians of Islam that come from the West are highly influenced by the Enlightenment period, ideas from the Enlightenment, from what's also called modernity or the Aufklärung. And in order to really understand history or to get a grasp of basic ideas in history, you have to know what's called historiography or the theory of how to do history. And so this is kind of a basic introductory book on historiography. And again, I'm hoping that you're pausing my YouTube videos and looking these books up. So this one is by Jorg Igers. So historiography in the 20th century from scientific objectivity to the postmodern challenge. And so you know, historians have always tried to prevent, pre present in the West, historians have always tried to present um, history as a science. It is meticulous and it's just as scientific as studying biology, for instance. And so this book is another book on historiography here that I think you all should take a look at. So Historiography, Ancient, Medieval, and Modern, 3rd edition, Ernst Breisach. And this is from the University of Chicago Press, all the matter. And um, getting an idea of how people theorized about how to do history over the millennia is very important as well because then you're going to understand the Western historical critical method. Why are these Orientalists looking at Islam and Islamic history and see certain kind of what may seem to be unusual to believing Muslims who have studied their own history? And, you know, why are their epistemologies, their ways of thinking so different? And how can we, you know, understand one another? And how can we come to terms with the historical data that they present and fashion in their own ways. Um, and for especially for those in academia who are interested in decolonizing uh, history, uh, you know, it's very important to read these types of books. But also the layperson needs to have an idea that historians come with their own, their own, their own theories as to what is history. And to understand that is quite important. And to understand modernity, the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, all that stuff in general is important and everything that came along with it. Such as race theory, the fact that we're different races and eugenics and colonization and Protestantism and all these things that capitalism that all come together that are linked together in one package along with Enlightenment thought, along with the Renaissance, the Cartesian cogito from René Descartes, you know, and all these things. And so this is a great book here that I would recommend, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, from Max Weber, who is known as the father of modern sociology. Helps you understand that capitalism could not, you know, modern capitalism as a phenomenon of the past couple hundred years could not have emerged without Protestant religious thought and how capitalism is different than medieval ways of doing economics. And along that same note, you have a book called The Origin of Capitalism, A Longer View, from Ellen Wood by Verso Press, which is one of my favorite publishers. And to understand, you know, like I said, the, the historians they, in the West, they wanted to view themselves as doing a scientific inquiry. And they're a science just like any other science. And therefore, this book here by Michel Foucault, Father of postmodernity, as some would say, 
the order of things, an archaeology of human sciences, he talks about how Western science came to be and how it was different from uh, scholarly activity in the medieval period, during the Renaissance and the likes, and how people began to think about things in modernity and think about things as scientific and how that gained authority amongst people and how scientific fields emerged like biology, archaeology, sociology and these different things. This is where he you know, demonstrates to us what is called the episteme or his theory of the grill and these different things here. And if you want to understand postmodernity, reading him is definitely good there because now you have many academics using postmodern theories in their history and the way they do history. I personally am a fan of doing psychohistory using psychology to explain historical phenomena. And I'm quite interested in uh, psychoanalytic theory, you know, psychoanalysis as um, you know, presented by Sigmund Freud and later people like uh, Carl Jung, Jacques Lacan, and so on. And in a lot of ways, psychoanalysis has undermined much of Western thought. It undermines much of modernity, much of uh, the Enlightenment theories. Um, they try a lot, like Jacques Lacan and others have tried to refute science in a sense. And I'm oversimplifying, of course, but um, this book here, Decolonizing Psychoanalysis, or Decolonial Psychoanalysis, rather, I misspoke, Towards Critical Islamophobia Studies by Robert Bashara. I highly recommend. That's uh, one of my favorite reads there. And, um, you know, using uh, psychoanalysis in order to decolonize one's way of doing history, in order to fight Islamophobia and such things like that. Um, I tried my best to give you, uh, you know, some books here that would help introduce, you know, somebody to the, the study of Islamic history. Of course, you can also reference um, the traditional biographies of the Prophet Muhammad Sira, as it's known, and uh, the biographies of like the Khulafa Rashidin, um, you know, like Omar, Abu Bakr, Ali, Uthman, and so on. Also, even Taha Hussein, who I, I mentioned here, here, uh, you know, in his autobiography, Taha Hussein, he, he wrote about his own life in the Nahba and how he studied at Azhar and went and did his PhD in France. Um, he wrote a book called Al Fitna Al Kubara. So he wrote about, you know, early Islamic history too. Um, consult those things as well. I'm not saying to ignore anything that I did not mention here in this video. I'm just, for someone who's interested in learning about Islamic history in the English language, I tried to give you a basic kind of curriculum here you can follow to advance your studies. After this, you can go on and read more specialized books on very specific topics, but this is just a basic groundwork kind of information that, anybody would need to know about Islamic history. Um, and certainly you can go on and read like, uh, you know, Tariq Tabari or whatever you like, um, if you know Arabic. Um, thanks again for watching my video. Um, please like the video, you know, hit the subscribe button, um, you know, do the little bell thing to get notifications. I try to, you know, do at least one video uh, weekly here for you guys on Islamic history, but I'm hoping to do more. And um, you can also check out me, you know, check out my other profiles like on Twitter, Facebook, Patreon, and, and so forth. Um, and please, please leave some comments below. I want to know what you think, or if you have other book recommendations, what are some good books to learn Islamic history. Um, I'll try my very best to respond as soon as I can. And um, if you have any more questions about how one would start learning Islamic history, please feel free to put them in the comments below. Um, I guess that's pretty much everything, so ma'asamama.